And when they read, they don't read the Bible meditatively. They don't stay in their closet and believe that God is speaking to them through his word. That's why most of them cannot appreciate the fact that these their leaders are like the Jewish religious leaders. They have fallen from the faith, if assuming they had the faith in the first place. The Bible is full of warnings about false elders, false pastors, false Jehovah's false bishops. Those are men and women who are in ministry for money and money alone. Any pastor or general overseer or bishop or whatever you call them who advertises that he or she is doing miracles come to church on Sunday, this building and there will be healing is in the ministry to make money. No exception. These false leaders sell greed. That's what they're selling and healing to their gullible followers. And many of them will part with their salaries under the guise of 10%. Some even sell their properties and give their proceeds to these people to pray for them. They have been so blinded. That is these people who continue to flock to these buildings called churches, who flock to these fake pastors and universities. If you told them that they are using their money to buy fleets of cars, live in expensive homes, and maintain a lifestyle that many rich unbelievers could only dream about, they will run you out of their houses. Because I've been so blinded. Greed sells. And that's because they themselves are greedy too. Let's move to the next item. There were many eyewitnesses of Christ's resurrection. Next scripture, please. I read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 8. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen by Kephas then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain to the present but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. Praise the Lord for his word. There are many biblical accounts of Christ's resurrection. In the Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of Mark, John, and in Paul's accounts. He was seen by so many, so I'm going to recap a few. Mary Magdalene and other women who came away to the tomb that early Sunday morning. In Matthew chapter 28 verses 1 to 10. By Cleophas and another disciple on the road to Emmaus. This was in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 31. By Peter, according to Luke chapter 24, 34. By the other apostles in Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 49. He was also seen by disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Those who were there were Simon Peter, Thomas called a twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of the disciples. This is in John chapter 21, verses 2 to 22. He was also seen by 500 disciples at once, according to our, the, what we, the scripture we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6. And brother Paul also saw him, but... You know, in the book of Acts, when he met him on the road to Damascus. And I want to say something else. Many followers of Christ have seen the resurrected Lord or heard his voice through the centuries to now. I want to leave it at that. Christ, as the head of his church, is always visiting and speaking to those whose hearts are fully yielded to his lordship. You want to hear his voice? You want to see his form? 
Yield yourself completely and he will, he will come visiting. Praise the Lord. Ten of the eleven apostles and many of the eyewitnesses paid the price for speaking the truth of his resurrection with their lives. Don't you think they would have recanted their testimony when faced with death? Had they not seen the resurrected Lord? Their blood confirmed the eyewitnesses as truth. Sorry, the eyewitness as truth. Through the centuries, many believers who died to contend for the gospel of Christ have paid the price for their audacity with their lives. Speak the truth, try and contend for the gospel, you'll be persecuted. And the time is coming when you'll be killed. Even in this 21st century, are you aware? There are many people who are still watering the gospel of Christ with their lives in some parts of the world. People are still being killed in some parts of the world for their faith. Number five. The Son of God continued to teach after his resurrection. Next scripture, please. I read from Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 49. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened, and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do, you, why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he has said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Praise the Lord for his word. Verse 39. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. So what do we make of that? Christ still had his human body. But he's also God. That's why he could move through walls. The other Lord has flesh and bones. So when he's going to ascend, he's going to ascend with both the flesh and bones into heaven. And we're going to be like him when we meet him. That means we'll also move through walls. And we also travel at the speed, maybe greater than light, speed of light. But that's a matter of another day, praise the Lord. Christ came to fulfill that which God had promised. The redemption of fallen humanity, that's what he was teaching them now in the scripture we read. Thus it is written, thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in the name of Jesus Christ to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem by those eyewitnesses. That is the charge to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. In conclusion, those who had the good news from the apostles and the other eyewitnesses passed it to those who followed them. And that pattern has continued to now. Believers are called to proclaim the good news and to teach those who believe the commands of Christ. We're not called for anything else. Proclaim the good news, teach them the commands of Christ. And it begins in our houses. 
and then to our neighbors and the neighborhood. The Lord never asked us to tax people to erect buildings in his name. Collect offerings and tithes in his name. And to use the money to pay lazy young men and women. Yes. And or to enrich ourselves. It is always about Jesus. It is about his love. It is about his sacrifice. It is about his commands. Let me make a correction. Last week I made a comment about Christmas, December 25. Yes, it is, happens in the Western Church. Then I said something about the so-called Eastern Church. Actually, the correct thing would be, it's not January 6th. It is in many Orthodox churches, even though they still, some of them practice that on December 25, because they're following what we call the Julian calendar made by Julius Caesar. But January 7 is the date. And that is valid from 1901 to 2000, 2100, whatever that means. So I just wanted to make a correction. So um, after 2101, it will be January 8. So they shifting for the Orthodox, part of the Orthodox churches. So, but let's not go into that now because it's another thing altogether to go into all that. But it has to do with the Gregorian calendar and the Julian calendar. So it's not January 6th, but January 7th for some Orthodox churches. I need to make that correction before we continue. So let's come to what we are talking about. Who would you choose? You and I must make a choice today. The Lord is watching and I'm asking that question to you and to myself. Whom are you going to choose? Knowing that the grave could not hold the Son of God. He came out of the grave with his humanity because they, even though the body was crucified, he went down to the grave. But he's the Son of God. So he took the keys of death and Hades and came up and gave gifts to you and I. He, because he took captivity captive and rendered them hopeless. So who do you choose? Your life, yes, or Jesus. Your wealth, or Jesus. Your health, or Jesus. Your family, or Jesus. Because those are things they used to get us to come into those buildings called churches to deceive us. If you choose Jesus, then nothing can ever get you. They can never get you. But let me help you make that choice. I want you to consider this. Are you aware that our stay on this earth is so infinitesimal, that is, it is so negligible that it does not even record on the eternity scale? Our stay here. Even the most sensitive microscope will never find it on the eternity map. Because it is so tiny, so small that like you cannot see it. When you look at eternity, the vista of eternity, permanent forever, endless beginnings. Yet, that very infinitesimal time on earth determines where you and I will be forever. So in making that choice, I want you to see your life. I'm, I'm seeing my life. I'm comparing. Is it better to have my life or to give it to Jesus? Wealth or to give it to Jesus? Family or to give it to Jesus? Meaning, he comes first in everything. Everything you do must go through the prism of Jesus. What did Jesus have me do? Because my life is hidden in him. So for me, I've made a choice. I'd rather have Jesus. And nothing else. I would rather have Jesus and nothing else. So I sing a song. I would rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I would rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. 
I would rather be led by his nail pierced hands than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I would rather have Jesus than anything that this world are forced today. I'd rather have Jesus than men's applause. You know, many people depend on men's applause, human beings' applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause, preaching the gospel, teaching, not charging anyone for it, because they freely have received, freely give. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name. Remember, it was that tiny dot that you cannot distinguish in eternity. I'd rather have Jesus than be king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. That's my choice. Because Jesus is fairer than lilies of rarest bloom. He is sweeter than honey 